welcome everyone to the fourth session of Designing for PUE Lighting and Automation, where top design professionals and subject matter experts with experience in designing and constructing Power Ethernet intelligent buildings share their best practices and lessons learned. This session will outline the new phases of design and construction you can and should expect in your PUE intelligent building project. Through this and future sessions, you will gain crucial skills and knowledge essential to delivering better intelligent buildings for developers and owners. If you haven't already done so, please click on the link that I'm gonna to add to the chat line right now to register for the following sessions. And in case you haven't seen all of them, go back and watch the first three sessions. This session, uh, sorry, the next session will be hosted by Louis Sao with Louis Sao Consulting, who has who was the sorry, who was the technology driving force at from Cisco at the Sinclair Marriott, and will cover the best practices in network design for PUE lighting and automation projects, as well as the special topic that you should definitely come and check out: the DC microgrid. Uh, I'm also excited to re-announce again that we've expanded the series to seven online sessions hosted each week for the next month. The last session will be Friday, October 2nd to not interfere with the Bixie Conference. Keep an eye out for some announcements from us about the Bixie Conference coming up because some of the presenters are also working with us to do some very exciting things for Bixie. So keep your ears peeled, register for all the sessions, and if you need to do a refresher course, reach out to us and let us know we could talk about redoing some of these sessions live with some of your audience, if that will help. Like I said, definitely register to get the absolute best advice on PUE lighting and automation. And definitely, um, I'll just note here, I've watched the speakers make these presentations and I'm still taking notes for our own business and for my own projects. So these are hugely valuable sessions Make sure you register to have your place in the future sessions because seating is limited. So without further ado, I will introduce our speaker today. Larry Jones is an associate and senior electrical engineer with Baird Hampton and Brown Incorporated. He has over 40 years of experience engineering, sorry, 40 years of engineering experience in electrical power distribution systems, design, lighting design, and communication systems design for a wide variety of commercial, industrial, and institutional clients. He is the electrical engineer of record and the lighting designer of record for the Sinclair, a recently completed project that converted a 1930s era Art Deco office building into a 21st century state-of-the-art Marriott Autograph Collection Hotel. So with that, Larry, I am gonna go ahead and turn the time over to you because I'm excited to see what you have to present for us today. Thanks, Tyler. I appreciate that. And good afternoon, everyone. Let me share my screen here and pull up the slide presentation. There we go. Well, I appreciate everyone being here today. As Tyler said, if you've not watched the three previous sessions, we'd encourage you to go back and do that. Uh, the very first one, we talked about the value proposition. You know, what is an intelligent building? What does PLE lighting and automation bring to the project? What's the value that it's added? Then Donnie talked about uh, really the what what is an intelligent building? What are all the components, the various parts and pieces? What can you do? I mean, the sky's the limit with an intelligent building and it all starts with POE lighting. Then last week, Hannah talked about the who, uh, the different roles. And one of the things we hope that you take away from this series of webinars is the fact that designing an intelligent building is really a team effort. You know, there are no soloists. We all have to work together and cooperate. And it, it just, it is a team effort. And so what I want to talk about now is when do certain things have to happen? 
anyway, uh, what I was saying, you know, when you're a child, things just happen. Your parents take care of things for you. They do things for you. You don't really, you're not paying attention to how it happens or exactly who does it necessarily. They just do it. And then once you move out, you go off to college or you get a job and, you know, get an apartment somewhere, you find that there are all sorts of things that you now have to do for yourself that was done for you and you didn't understand how they got done. Well, that's sort of what happens in the building design and construction process. We all have our own little uh, <clears throat> blinders on. We each deal with a little piece of that project and we don't necessarily see how it all goes together. And that has got to change with intelligent buildings because as I said, it's a team effort. And so it's really important to understand who all the players are and who does what and how they all fit together and when it has to happen. So that's kind of what I want to talk about today. So let's start with typical project phases. You know, this is going to be something that if you're an architect or engineer or somebody else involved in the uh, design and construction process, you're familiar with these. The uh, American Institute of Architects, the AIA Standard Owner Architect Agreement identifies uh, five phases of the design process. So here they are, and we'll talk briefly about what each of these uh, consists of and, <clears throat> excuse me, what from the intelligent building design standpoint needs to happen in each one of these phases. But before we do that, there's really a, another, maybe it's not a phase, but I put it in as phase zero, zero, project planning. Because if I want to hire an architect to design a project for me, the first thing we're gonna do is sit down and talk about what it is I need, what do I want? And so uh, that's what I'm referring to as project planning. It's not programming. The AIA agreement talks about programming. Those of you who are architects understand what that means. That's just when the architect helps the owner decide, you know, how many square feet do I need? How many offices? You know, what are the relationships between all these people? Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just sitting down with the, the owner and talking about what's needed. Letting the owner say, this is what I need. This is when I need it. Talk about the quality. You know, if, if they're going to want a corporate boardroom, then they're probably talking about high-end finishes, high-end light fixtures, and all sorts of things like that. Uh, you know, if they're talking about, you know, a, a huddle room in an office, or they're talking about a meeting room, it's totally different. You know, and this is a time that you talk about sustainability. You know, do you want the project to be lead accredited? You know, if so, what level? Uh, and talk about project budget. This is also the point at which you would want to talk to the owner about an intelligent building. And hopefully, if you have been with us thus far for these webinars and, and stay with us for the rest of them, you'll be well equipped to go sit down with an owner and say, you know, this is really a cool project. Have you thought about making it an intelligent building? And then you can talk to them about why they might want to make it an intelligent building. This is the place to do that. So what are the intelligent building tasks during this project planning phase? The key thing is if an owner wants to build an intelligent building, it's in his or her best interest to make that decision up front. You know, they could wait until later in the process, but what's going to happen is it's going to cost time and money if the decision is not made at the very outset of the project. So it's very advantageous to the owner to go ahead and make that, if they want to do it, make the commitment up front. And they need to understand that they're committing to additional scope. They're committing to which building systems they want to be intelligent because it could just be POE lighting, but really that's the backbone for an intelligent building. Once you have the POE lighting in place and the network necessary to support it, then you can talk about, okay, we're gonna have to have uh, occupant sensors as part of that lighting control system. Maybe those occupant sensors communicate with the building automation system rather than have a separate set of sensors for the building automation system. So now you're starting to create an intelligent building, a building that has various subsystems that communicate with one another. So, you know, the owner would need to make a commitment as to what 
extent do they want the building to be intelligent? Is it POE lighting or is it more? Then they also need to understand that they're committing to involvement of their IT and OT staff from the outset. You know, if you're not familiar with both of those terms, IT, you know, information technology, OT, operational technology, you know, the IT folks are the ones that make all the voice and data stuff work, and the OT folks are the ones that make the building work. And if you can visualize a Venn diagram, uh, I think you'll see this in one of our other presentations coming up, but if you visualize a Venn diagram and one circle is IT, one circle is OT, and you move them together so there's an overlap, that overlap is your intelligent building because both IT and OT are stakeholders in an intelligent building and they need to be involved at the very outset. So the owner needs to commit to, you know, to having them involved at the outset. They need to commit to additional floor space for the required equipment. And finally, they need to commit to earlier involvement in consultants. Now I'm not talking necessarily about DMEP consultants, uh, although the electrical engineer and lighting designer, you know, whether they're one and the same or two different uh, persons or groups, you know, they need to be involved early on. But one of the things that in our experience is one of the last things to get done in a building is for somebody to sit down and figure out, okay, how are we going to connect all these voice data outlets that the electrical engineer, you know, slapped down on their drawings? And so, you know, with an intelligent building, you cannot wait until the project is designed. You've got to have the people who are going to do the structured cabling design, the RCDDs or whoever, uh, maybe it's a low voltage contractor. They're also a stakeholder in the success of a uh, intelligent building project. So they need to be involved early on in that design process. So, you know, just to summarize this, the owner needs to understand if they're going to commit to an intelligent building, and we hope they want to, uh, that, you know, they're making some additional commitments in terms of scope, staff, and uh, earlier involvement. So, when you're talking to the owner, what do you think the next question is going to be? And maybe, maybe the question after you ask about an intelligent building. What does it cost? What is it going to cost me to do this? You know, you've convinced me this is, would really be in my best interest. This would really be great. What's it going to cost though? So <clears throat> the answer to that is it depends. So how do the costs compare? First off, let me say that historical cost data is limited right now because PLE lighting and intelligent buildings are relatively new technology. It's real easy to compare one project with another, but it's really easy to compare apples and oranges. It, the comparison is valid only if you're comparing apples and apples. And there are a number of factors that are going to affect the construction cost. Number one being the size of the project. Uh, you know, and then the quality and completeness of the contract documents. If the documents are clear as to exactly what it is that is expected on the part of the contractor and the installers, you're going to get better pricing. And then experience of the bidders and suppliers. You know, if you have suppliers who are like, POE, what? Uh, you know, and bidders who are not really familiar with it, then they're going to throw dollars at it. So experience makes a difference as does market at the time of the bidding. So all these things affect the cost. So with that said, the bottom line is in our experience right now, at least in our market in this area and in Texas, if the design is clear and you're using experienced contractors, the cost of a POE lighting system is about the same or less than the cost of the equivalent line voltage lighting system. Now we've heard uh, from some other parts of the country where there were huge savings uh, because it was a very large project. They were having to use union labor. Uh, you know, those numbers sound really, really good, but our experience on a typical project, let's say, is that if it's designed uh, and the design is communicated clearly, if it's designed properly and you have experienced people beating it, the cost is going to be about the same. So there are two factors in the cost of POE. Uh, 
that, that make it attractive. Number one is less man hours required to install the PV lighting systems. Uh, it's class two wiring, which means it does not have to be in conduit. The powering controls are provided over a single cable. So now I don't have power run to the light fixture and a separate low voltage control circuit. So the savings really is in the man hours. Um, and then a second factor in the POE lighting is that the lighting controls are an integral part of the POE lighting system. So you don't have to buy a separate lighting control system. Uh, someone asked me just recently to look at a four story wood frame construction, uh, basically prototype hotel that they were pricing. And they said, you know, how much do you think we can save if we, if we went PLE lighting on this project? And, uh, and it was already designed, line voltage lighting. So when I looked at it, I said, well, you know, number one, this is code minimum. There's really nothing you can take out of what the other engineer has designed. And so, you know, the, the less man hours for POE, yeah, maybe a little savings, probably not a lot. The real savings on that particular project was the fact that you didn't need several uh, lighting control systems that they included. Uh, and I don't know if they were able to go sell the project on that basis or not, but those are the two factors in our experience that make the biggest difference in uh, the cost difference between POE and line voltage. Less man hours to install it, and you don't need separate lighting control systems. So now let's talk about the design phases. The very first phase that AIA recognizes is the schematic design phase. And this is where I like to describe it as getting what's in your head onto paper. You know, the architect's gonna go back and with all the input from the owner that he's gotten and maybe a program from the owner, you know, he or she's gonna think about, okay, what do I want this building to look like? And they're gonna have a concept in their mind and they're gonna put it on paper. It's conceptual. <clears throat> and for the, the other consultants, typically, you know, we would just write a narrative of the materials and systems that we propose so that the architect can take their conceptual drawings back to the owner, take our narratives back and say, okay, here's kind of what we're thinking. And we're thinking about these systems. Are you good with that? So when we're talking about intelligent buildings, there's some things that really need to happen during the schematic design phase. First off, work with the owner's IT and OT groups. They're gonna have input on, on requirements for the intelligent building systems and equipment. Uh, for example, one project we did recently, uh, the IT group said, you know, okay, you know, we're okay with PLE lighting. We like that idea, we've done it before. We own the switches, we control the switches because they're on our network. And cybersecurity is, you know, a critical uh, item for this particular client. So no problem with that. Then they said, and we want those switches to live in, in our rooms, not in an electrical room or separate room somewhere. We want it to live in our room under control of IT. And oh, by the way, we only buy certain switches. And so you have to use this kind of switch, which we were okay with. Uh, but those kinds of things need to be defined early on because, for example, uh, the group in this case wanted the switches in their room. So that meant that the architect need to know, needed to know during schematic design, I'm probably going to need to allocate a bigger room for the IDF to put this IT equipment in. Uh, so it's important to, during the schematic design phase, to talk to both the, the IT people and the OT people who are going to have to operate it. Uh, <clears throat> Research applicable local and national codes and standards. That's critical. We've talked about that in a couple of the previous presentations. Know what the local requirements are. Contact the AHJ, even at the schematic design phase, and say, we're working on this project, and you know we're going to use uh, low voltage DC, power over ethernet lighting. We're gonna use intelligent building technology. We're gonna do this, this, and this, you know, and you know, involve them, make them a part of the team, really, because that will pay dividends later on. And then uh, during the schematic design phase, you really need to determine the approximate size and location of the spaces required. Uh, and then you need to develop a narrative that would talk about the topology of the system. Is it distributed or centralized? Uh, you know, functionality, you know, how does it work? What controls what? Uh, 
locations of equipment, proposed level of systems integration. All these things will make a little more sense as we talk further uh, about detailed design, but you need to communicate to the owner what it is you're looking at. The topology is important because in the example I just gave, that's a centralized system where the PoE switches are all in a rack somewhere. We typically don't do that. We typically like to put the switches above the ceiling somewhere, but it's important that that topology be defined in the schematic design phase so that everybody knows the direction they're going. Uh, you know, nobody likes surprises after the fact, oh, uh, sorry, Mr. and Ms. Architect, but this IDF just doubled in size because we got more equipment going in it. Sorry about that. You know, we don't want to do that. We want to, we want to intelligently design an intelligent building, if you will. So, recommended best practices. Plan for the POE lighting and other intelligent building systems at the very outset. We cannot emphasize that enough. That is critical. And then something that really, really should be considered is to have a design charrette. And if you're not familiar with a design charrette, that's when all the design team gets together with the users and you talk about, you know, what do you need? What are, uh, in this case, you talk about stakeholder responsibilities. Let's sit down and talk with everybody, IT, OT. Who's gonna own the switches? Who's gonna maintain them? You know, how does this happen? Uh, what do you need? What are the corporate standards? Some companies have some very strict IT standards that uh, you know, we come in and we want to design an intelligent building. That design needs to meet their standards. You know, is there a preferred topology? You know, in the case of my example, they wanted the switches centralized in a closet somewhere as opposed to distributed. And then the level of systems integration. You know, the idea is that you want to come away from uh, schematic design with everybody kind of clear in their mind what the outline of this system looks like. Because the next thing you're going to do is move to design development phase. This is when the architect starts to develop final plans. You know, the owners, hopefully at that point, you know, bought off on the schematic design, said, yes, I like the concept, I like the way you've done this. And Hopefully they said, okay, I'm, you know, I'm really good with what you're planning for the intelligent building. <clears throat> Excuse me. So typically for the design development phase, the deliverables are going to be detailed floor plans, uh, not final, but, you know, detailed floor plans, reflected ceiling plans, sections, elevations, maybe some preliminary construction details. You know, you're moving toward the final drawings. You're not there yet, but you're beginning to flesh them out. And so at this point, there'll be diagrammatic drawings of the MEP systems typically, showing where the major components are located, you know, showing that we have enough room and proposed routing for MEP in infrastructure. And typically to be outline specifications, uh, saying this is the quality of the materials and products that, that we're proposing to use. So during design development, if we're designing an intelligent building, one of the things that you're going to want to do is finalize the locations and space requirements for the equipment. And then you've got to make sure that the uh, power and cooling loads for that equipment is communicated to the building, uh, to the MEP engineer, to make sure that they provide the adequate infrastructure to support that. And then it's also important for the design team to select the POE lighting fixtures at this point run lighting calculations to validate the fixture selection. When we did Sinclair, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of that shortly. When we did Sinclair, uh, we had to work not only with uh, the architect and interior designers concepts and to come up with lighting that would complement what they wanted to do, but the lighting levels had to meet Marriott hotel standards uh, for that particular brand. And so we actually had to run calculations in uh, and show that, that we did meet it. Then you'll need a preliminary light fixture schedule, which is basically a list of, the, of all the light fixtures and their characteristics and outline specifications. So then we'd move to contract documents phase. And this is where we uh, really wrap things up. You know, the, the deliverable or a set of seal drawings ready to go for permit or bidding in a project manual uh, with all the detailed specifications. So during contract document phase for an intelligent building, 
uh, you're going to have to finalize the peel light fixture selections and locations. You know, everything has to be nailed at this stage of the project. Uh, and then finalize all the equipment selections. You know, if you, you know, added some switches, let's say, or something changed, make sure the MEP engineer is aware of it. And then you have to provide a comm check for this phase. If you're not involved in building, design, and construction, you may not be familiar with that, but comm check is a software program that uh, the Department of Energy makes available that allows you to put in characteristics about the building, put in information about mechanical systems, the lighting, and it will uh, calculate all of those results in accordance with energy code, whatever energy code you tell it you're required to comply with. And it will provide a certificate that says your design complies with the energy code. That's important for AHJs. Then you want to show all the PLE light fixtures, nodes, control devices, and you know, everything required for the system on the drawings, including daylighting zones. Now, we typically would not do the work of the RCDD at this point. We would not design the structured cabling system, but we would provide enough detailed information in the contract documents that a low voltage contractor and or an RCDD could then take the drawings and sit down and say, okay, I've got to connect this to this to this, got it, and design the structured cabling system. And then it's important in the contract documents phase with POE lighting, identify on the drawings which POE switch port and node is served, uh, you know, is serving the light fixtures, which node goes back to which switch port, show switch locations. And when I say switch, I mean the POE switch if you're using distributed topology. All those things are important for accurate pricing. And then a really key thing for contract documents is identify clearly how you're handling emergency lighting. Uh, if you heard our first session, uh, I mentioned that when we were doing Sinclair, one of the first things we did was sit down with the AHJ, uh, the chief electrical inspector and the fire marshal and they identified very few things they were going to require us to do if we were using low voltage DC lighting. But one of the, well, the very first thing they said was, you must comply with all the building code requirements for emergency lighting and egress lighting. That is critical. So, you know, be sure that that's called out clearly on, on the contract documents. So what are our recommended best practices? So here's what we found. Show the POE lighting fixtures on the electrical drawings for coordination, but don't show all the low voltage details on the electrical drawings. I mean, typically, you're gonna have drawing, electrical drawings that show the power plans, receptacles, equipment that needs to be powered. You're gonna have drawings that show the light fixtures, uh, the switches and those kinds of things. Then you're gonna have maybe a set of you know, sheets that are gonna show riser diagrams, one line diagrams, then maybe details, schedules, and those kinds of things. So on the typical Division 26 drawings, we recommend just showing the light fixture locations for, for coordination on the electrical drawings. Then pull together all of the low voltage in a separate group. For example, if, I mean, typically maybe the E1 series would be power. Some people make it lighting, but so E1's power for our discussion, E2's lighting, E3's one lines and uh, riser diagrams, E4 schedules and so on like that. So let's say we decide we're gonna make the low voltage drawings an E8 series drawings. They could be T drawings, but if you have a separate technology consultant, their drawings are probably gonna have a T on them. So to avoid confusion, uh, we like to just group all the low voltage sheets together so it's not mixed in with the other Division 26 work. And there's a reason for that, uh, which I'll get to in just a moment. But best practice, keep all the low voltage stuff together. You know, and that's where you're gonna show all your details, the, the PLE light fixtures, you know, the switches, the sensors, nodes, uh, the light fixture schedule will be there. And you know, I, I spoke earlier this year at an Eliminating Engineering Society meeting and I said, pull the light fixtures out of Division 26, and I got a, ah! but if your light fixtures are POE, it makes sense to us to have the low voltage 
installer who's doing it provide the light fixtures. It makes, well, what will happen if the electrical contractor as part of the Division 26 package where he's buying wire and conduit and panel boards, if he buys the POE light fixtures, all he's gonna do is hand them off to the low voltage contractor. And if something doesn't work, then you're gonna have this. So our thought is keep all the low voltage together. You know, the low voltage uh, contractors can buy the light fixtures just as well as the electrical contractor. And it's just gonna take some time, uh, I think for the business to recognize that. Uh, but you know, if I were the low voltage contractor, I would rather buy the light fixtures myself personally and have them under my contract. And then if something goes wrong with it, then I can go back to my supplier and say, hey, I have a problem with this fixture. I need you to do something about it. You know, what are you gonna do? And then add a provision in the specs requiring that low voltage systems installers submit proof of prior experience. And ideally uh, be Bixi certified so that you know that the low voltage installer knows what they're doing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, let me give you a few examples of, of what this really looks like. This is Sinclair. For those of you who may not have seen our, <clears throat> our meeting the team, uh, you know, our multiple presentations about Sinclair, but this is the bar in Sinclair. And just for what it's worth, all of these fixtures are power ethernet powered, every one of them. So, and I'm showing you this just to say, you know, if you're an architect or interior designer or lighting designer, you know, we can power any kind of light fixture power over ethernet. It, it is doable and we did it at Sinclair. So uh, with that, this is a quarter from Sinclair. And remember I mentioned that early on, uh, we needed to calculate lighting levels. The diagram right here is actually taken from an AGI 32, which is the software we use. AGI 32 printout. This is superimposed on the architectural floor plan. These Ds are our fixtures and they're directional. The little uh, triangle kind of indicates what direction the fixtures are oriented for us. And so they're oriented toward the doors to light the doors. And then you have a fur down in the, uh, the corridor here. So we ran this and just to prove that we had to put in the levels that Marriott required. Then we also, the software also allows us to make a rendering. And so we created a rendering and AGI 32 is pretty cool in that if we have uh, images of the finishes that the interior designer wants to use, we can actually put them in the program and, and create a rendering that, that looks somewhat, I mean, realize it's a computer rendering, but it is more lifelike than if we just had lines and, and paper here. So it kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like. This is an important phase that needs to happen. If somebody just says, oh, well, let's, let's take out the line voltage lighting and put in uh, POE lighting, somebody really needs to look at the fixtures that are being proposed and make sure that they're gonna work. Here's some other examples. These are all AGI 32. Uh, the lobby is up here and uh, you know, it looks pretty much like the real lobby. And then uh, here's another corridor. This one was interesting because the interior designer uh, did not have as, as much light in here as, as we have. We actually model it just the way they designed it. And when we ran the calcs with the, the dark finishes, the existing marble and the dark carpeting that they wanted to use, we did not have the required foot candle level. So we were able to go back and say, okay, we need to change this. You know, let's talk about, you know, what, what will work from a design standpoint? You know, what would you be happy with from a design standpoint? And then let us rerun it. So this is the final design we came up with, but it's important to, to do these kinds of things with, uh, especially with POE lighting. So here's a typical Division 26 lighting plan. Uh, I say typical. Uh, this particular one, this, this is POE. And so you'll notice that uh, we have light fixtures here. These two by twos are light fixtures. Uh, 
type A, uh, and then he indicates an, it's an emergency fixture. This actually came from a Revit project. So in Revit, these were actually 3D objects. If we were doing this in AutoCAD, we would have been able to have uh, easily just shown the light fixtures. But uh, in Revit, uh, we created a tag that tells you what kind of node or driver is provided with the fixture. And rather than go back and try to fix it here, we just, uh, we didn't show all the circuiting, but that's what this is. Uh, this means nothing to the electrical contractor, but it, it's very important for the low voltage contractor. But typically on our division 26 lighting plans, now we're going to show the fixture locations for coordination with the ceiling, with mechanical, uh, here are vacancy sensors. We're going to show those. We're going to show switch locations. Typically your division 26 contractor is going to put a box in the wall for you and stub conduit up above the ceiling for low voltage. But this is what a, our lighting plan looks like. We're not showing any details for the POE. Then here's what our low voltage lighting plan looks like. So, you know, it looks very similar to what we had before, but notice now the, the nodes are tied together. And you have A's and B's. The A's and B's correspond in the way that we like to do it with the low voltage light switch here. So, that's saying that there are two switches. One controls the A fixtures, one controls the B fixtures. So it's clear the A, the A switch is gonna control you know, every other fixture here. The Bs control the others. Uh, and then we're showing how it's all wired together. This is showing, uh, it's a home run, but it's telling you what switch and what port on the switch feeds this group of four nodes. For example, here, uh, or two actually in this case, <clears throat> here's the other one up here. This particular uh, excerpt came from a fourth floor plan. <clears throat> so it's the fourth floor, it's the normal power system, not emergency, <clears throat> excuse me. The switch is S3, switch three, and it goes to port 23 on the switch so that a person designing the structured cabling system can look at this and understand, okay, I've got a cable that's going to go from here back to switch it to port 23 on switch S3. You know, we're not showing how it gets there. We're leaving that for the, the low voltage designer and structural cabling designer, but we're giving you all the information you need to design that system. Then we also have a typical connection diagram. This is going to vary from project to project, but uh, <clears throat> On the particular project I was just showing you, we put this in, it was based on using Cisco 9400 series switches and uh, Igor, as you can see. And so this just really shows for everyone's information, especially the AHJ, you know, how all this works that, you know, here's the, the gateway server that has the lighting control software on it. Yeah, it's connecting to the switches. You have power coming to the switches, which uh, we're picking up on the electrical power plans. And then on this project, uh, everybody agreed at the outset we'd use purple uh, jacketed CAT6 cable to indicate that it was POE lighting on the normal power source. So it's just kind of showing how things fit together. And, you know, wall switches are connecting, sensors are connecting. Just to give somebody not familiar with the system an idea of how all these things connect and how it works. And then we do the same thing for emergency, except for the emergency, we were using red jacketed uh, cable. Uh, <clears throat> so in, this says inverter, but it's really a UPS. You have to be careful with emergency lighting on, on POE that your power source doesn't drop out because it doesn't take uh, a long time at all for your switch to drop out and have to reboot. So that's just something to, to think about uh, with your emergency lighting. So, once we've issued the, the contract documents, now we're into bidding and negotiation. And everybody's probably familiar with this. You know, there'll, there'll be a pre-bid conference conducted by the architect and maybe the consultants just to say, here are the drawings, you know, here's the procedure for bidding, go for it, good luck. Uh, so, what are the intelligent building tasks during the bidding and negotiation phase? 
It's really important to make sure that the bidders are clear about the low voltage work and where lines are drawn in the documents. The last thing you want is for the electrical contractor to put together a price that it includes the low voltage work and then get a separate low voltage price and think they add together. It's really important to make sure that the bidders are clear on the fact that you are, you do have low voltage and that's why it's important to have the low voltage in its, in its own little group of, of pages. Uh, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, but make sure everybody's clear on the extent of the low voltage work, who's doing it. And uh, then of course we'll respond to any questions at this point. So best practice for this, encourage the general contractors to bid the POE lighting and other intelligent building systems work separately. Now, if I'm a general contractor and I have a set of documents that I have all my normal or typical division 26 stuff, and at the end of that, you know, I don't necessarily call it some other division, but at the end of that, now I have, say, a series of E800 sheets that are all low voltage. So what that allows me to do is, if I'm going to ask a large electrical contractor who has a low voltage shop or an electrical contractor who's partnered with a low voltage contractor, I can give them the whole set of, of, of electrical drawings, the typical division 26 plus the, the low voltage and say, give me a price on this. However, I could also take the typical division 26 sheets and pull them out of the set, hand them to an, another electrical contractor that I've worked with and trust, hopefully, and say, give me a price on this work. Then I can take those, the E800 series, the low voltage sheets, and hand them to a low voltage contractor I've worked with and say, you give me a pricing on this. Give me a bid on this. That's why uh, we recommend keeping all the low voltage stuff together, including the light fixtures, in you know one series of sheets that could be separated. So, but it's really, really important at this point for the general contractor uh, to bid the POE lighting separately or in you know, intelligent building systems separately from the other work, or make sure that the people bidding it are familiar with those other systems. Because again, if you have bidders that are bidding on something they're not really familiar with or not comfortable with, we all know what's going to happen. They're going to throw money at it. And uh, that's not what we want. That's not in the owner's best interest. So once that's been done, the contract's been awarded, then we're in construction administration phase. And most everybody's probably familiar with that. You know, you're going to, if you're a contractor or subcontractor, you're going to submit product, uh, data, you're going to submit shop drawings for the architect and engineers review. Uh, the AE team will make periodic visits to observe things and then we'll do our best to answer contractor RFIs and, and approve pay apps. That's what normally happens during this phase. So what is there for intelligent building design in the construction phase? A lot. So this is the point at which uh, the low voltage contractor would submit shop drawings and product data for all the intelligent building systems and equipment. Uh, and they would actually install it, of course. And then startup and commissioning is really important. Uh, you know, we tend to think of commissioning in terms of uh, somebody coming in after the fact and making sure that everything works. And that's not really what we're talking about here. Yes, you have to do that, but Startup and commissioning of intelligent building systems need to happen, needs to happen step by step as it goes in. And so you've got to work with, you know, the, the contractors involved and work with the owners IT and OT groups because you want to make sure that everything is working as it goes in. So this is a really important phase and I think Joe's probably going to address this in uh, his future presentation about the importance of startup and commissioning. And then owner training. This is important too. Uh, the intelligent building systems, uh, suppliers, manufacturers, the contractor, if there's a systems integrator involved, you know, they need to make sure the owner is trained on how to operate all of this stuff. I and mean, there's so much you can do with an intelligent building. Uh, you know, there's so much data that you can get from an intelligent building system, but it's of no use if the owner and his 
OT groups don't understand how to get that data and how to use it. And then finally, this is also the place that if third party commissioning is required, where that would happen. So with that, I hope, I know I've kind of flown through this, but uh, hopefully you got a better understanding of who should do what where. And this is not set in stone by any means, but just kind of best practices that we've discovered thus far in our journey in designing POE lighting and intelligent building systems. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to uh, do my best to answer them for you. Actually, Larry, you've got a bunch of great questions here ready to go. Um, so all of the attendees, feel free to submit your questions to the Q&A section. And Larry and I will field as many of these as we can as long as we have time. So uh, James would like to know, this is taking you back to the beginning of your presentation, when you're preparing for an owner for the cost conversation, how do you explain their, how do you explain their thinking past that first cost to cost over the life of the installation um, in terms of less expensive for moves, ads and changes, future proofing, et cetera? How do you handle that, Larry? Do you have any suggestions? Well, those are all things, and that's a great question. Those are all things that you would want to discuss with the owner when you talk about why you might want to consider uh, POE lighting or an intelligent building. Uh, you know, I didn't go into all those details, but, you know, one of the big selling points for one of our clients, because they are, you know, they are not static. They constantly rearrange their offices. And so the fact that with POE lighting, that it's, you know, a software change. You don't have to bring in your maintenance people or, you know, an electrical contractor and have them uh, rewire things. You just move stuff around and replug it and, you know, plug in your laptop and uh, you can reprogram all the devices so that things change. That's the kind of conversation you need to have with them. Now, you know, can you put a dollar amount on that? Uh, that's hard to do, but, uh, you know, I think most owners, if they have had much experience with remodels, they understand that this is a whole lot easier. You know, your first cost, Again, you know, like I said, our experience is that it's about the same, but it's really going to depend on how you bid it. Now, we did a very small project recently in, in downtown Fort Worth that uh, we, particularly the owner selected the general contractor, and they actually bid out the lighting as line voltage uh, to their electrical contractor, and then they also had a low voltage contractor bid the POE. And when it came back, they had almost exactly the same numbers. And so, you know, the owner said, okay, given the flexibility that we get with POE, given the fact that we just had a nightmare with a line voltage lighting control system, third party control system on another project, you know, it's a no brainer we're going POE. So I don't know if that helps answer the question or not, James, but, uh, you know, and, and let me say this too. Typically, the architect is going to be the one who's having these kinds of conversations with the owners. Now, we have a few clients that we work with directly, but for most of us, you know, on this webinar, we're probably not going to be the ones talking to the owner, trying to, to sell them on the idea of, you know, or at least get them to consider POE lighting and intelligent buildings. That's really going to be the role of the architect or the first person they're talking with. So it's really important for, you know, those people making that initial contact with owners and developers to understand themselves what's involved in POE and why it would be to an owner's advantage to do it. Larry, I think you're answering James's next question, which is what best practices do you have to make sure POE technology remains in the spec during the bid and value engineering phases? And it sounds like from what you're saying is making sure that you've communicated to the architect and other team members the, the value proposition for PUE lighting so that they understand it and they understand what they're arguing for, what they're, what they're supporting. Absolutely. You know, it goes back to what I said about the owner committing at the outset. Now, you know, the owner can always change their mind later. I mean, you know, we're not, as I tell my young engineers, you can't be married to your design. You may have the best design in the world, but you can't be married to it, you know, because things 
things can change. The owner's mind can change. And, you know, as long as they're willing to pay us to make the changes, that's not a problem. You know, we're here to serve our clients. But, uh, you know, it goes back to the owner making a commitment at the outset. You know, if the owner's convinced that this is in his or her best interest, that, uh, you know, the when you're looking at the, uh, the cost, not just initial cost, but, you know, over the life of the project, the fact that, you know, you're going to have less maintenance, you're going to have, uh, it's going to be easier to make changes. You know, when you look at all those things, uh, you know, it needs to be a given from the owner. If it's a given from the owner, then it's a no brainer. Right. Well, Jose is asking, uh, Larry, if you have any suggestions on Pee Wee lighting manufacturers you recommend. And I would, I would suggest, Larry, both lighting that is Pee Wee compatible, as well as people who do the equipment for the Pee Wee drivers, or both. So, do you have any suggestions that you like in, in, people to recommend? Well, when we started out uh, with Sinclair, you know, our palette of POE lighting fixtures was extremely limited. And I mean, to the point that the owner of Farouk uh, went to a custom light fixture manufacturer that does a lot of custom work for hospitality uh, facilities. And uh, so, you know, we had a lot of opportunities there, but as POE has caught on, you know, there are a number of different manufacturers now that uh, will provide POE compatible fixtures. Uh, you know, some of them work with uh, the driver manufacturers. I mean, there's several uh, that, that make good products. Uh, sometimes they, the fixture manufacturers will partner with a driver manufacturer and they'll provide the fixtures with the driver already installed in it. Uh, sometimes they're, they'll be willing to take the line voltage driver out of the fixture and just give you a DC connection where the driver can be mounted remotely. Uh, but we're finding that, uh, you know, I use the word palette because that's really what it is from a lighting design standpoint. Our palette is really growing now because initially some of the larger manufacturers are like, eh, I don't know about this. And a lot of the smaller manufacturers rushed in and said, absolutely, we'll work with you. We'll do POE. And so it's kind of like LED lighting. You know, when LED first came out, a lot of manufacturers were like, oh, I don't know about this. But you know, everything's LED now. And, you know, I'm going to, and I don't think I'm really going out of a limb. You know, I think we're going to see more and more POE probably increase is probably going to be exponential, you know, until that's going to be the industry standard. So, you know, what I would suggest, Jose, is if there's somebody whose light fixtures you like, talk to them. You know, I mean, I don't know what your role is. If you're not a lighting designer, if you're an architect, uh, you know, uh, get somebody to talk with them about, you know, can, can you provide POE? We want to go POE. We really like this fixture, but we want to go POE. You know, will you work with us and, you know, provide the fixture with a POE driver that we specify? Or, you know, would you take the line voltage driver out? Uh, and, you know, I've been amazed at how many uh, network connections, not, not literal network, but personnel network, you know, people network uh, that the various manufacturers and the driver manufacturers have. If you just start asking questions, if you go look online, you may be disappointed. But if you start asking questions, you're going to find, oh, yeah, we've done that. You know, we've worked with Igor. We've worked with Platformatics. You know, we've worked with New Leds. Uh, yeah, we can do it. So uh, as far as specific names, it changes so rapidly. Pick what you like and see if they'll work with you. That's my suggestion. Right. So, Larry, um, James is also asking, what division document is used to describe the behavior of the automation system, the zones, and the control narrative? Great question. Okay. The energy code for lighting, or the section of the energy code related to lighting, uh, pretty much prescribes the lighting controls. Uh, now, beyond that, you know, we can talk about uh, if we have a meeting room, you know, do we want to create scenes? You know, we may say, okay, we need a four scene controller here. 
Uh, I mean, the good thing with the PoE is that it's all programmable. It's all software programmable. So uh, there's a lot more flexibility, in my opinion, than having uh, a typical line voltage lighting control system. Not that you can't program those as well, but uh, you know, it's important as a lighting designer to, if you have something special, make sure that's communicated. And, and typically we would do that uh, either, I mean, typically on the drawings, uh, maybe in the specs, but, but generally speaking, if I ask for a foreseen controller on something, that's gonna be sufficient uh, because the owners ask for something and, and maybe, you know, maybe they want, you know, all off, you know, all on and a couple of other scenes, you know, that kind of information is typically not communicated in the contract documents. What's important is that you need a foreseen controller then exactly what those scenes are get set during commissioning, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Great question. So we have, uh, we have, I'm going to have to cut it off, Larry. We've got two more questions. Uh, if you have questions still out there, go ahead and submit them. Larry and I will make sure we follow up in a follow up email answering those questions. So Michael would like to know how long should a legacy lighting system last in a project? Um, and how long should a PUE lighting system? I think he's comparing, you know, existing technology versus the new technology. You showed some Cisco switches in the drawings. Do these switches have the same or equivalent life as the legacy lighting system? That is a great question. Uh, I'm not sure the actual lifetime. I've looked at the reliability. Let me put it that way. Uh, Lewis and I've had that discussion uh, previously. And when you start looking at uh, the mean time between failures on the PO switches, it is probably longer. I don't remember the exact number of years. I don't want to quote it and get it wrong, but uh, it's probably going to outlast uh, a lot of the arrangements in the buildings. The buildings will probably end up being remodeled uh, before the, the switches, for example, you know, have, have failed. If, if you look at the mean time between failures. Now, great question. Sorry, when man. you're looking at POE, you've got to also look at the fact versus legacy. Uh, you know, if you, if you go with a distributed system, it's a lot easier to replace the switches. Uh, with a line voltage kind of system, it's very difficult, uh, again, to, to, to rearrange things. But, you know, comparing them from a, you know, life standpoint, I would say both probably will outlast the arrangement in the building, that you're going to end up having to rearrange both systems before you have a problem with you know, a ser serious failure with either system. Mm -hmm. Great answer. Well, everyone, we are at the top of the hour. Uh, Larry has answered some great questions. There are a couple more in the queue. Larry, I'll send those over to you with an email to share with the, the, uh, the attendees. So thank you all so much, Larry. Fantastic presentation. I've been getting thank yous and kudos in the chat lines, Larry. Um, very popular. And we have used our time, and I believe we used it very well. Uh, don't forget to follow the link in the chat to see and register for the rest of the sessions. So I'm going to switch back over here to me, and we're going to wrap this up. Uh, I do have a, a quick note for all of you. If you do have any questions, um, you can contact Larry, um, and he is... Uh, a fantastic resource and or you can contact us uh, it you can answer the questionnaire at the end of the session you can email me any of the participants and let us know how you'd like to improve the trainings what things you're most interested in um, and any questions you may have so uh, thank you so much for coming everyone we are so glad to have you here this is why we do these presentations and we look forward to seeing you at next week's presentation with uh, Lewis. So y'all have a great week.